We are delighted that David Feinberg is here with us. David is the CEO of the UCLA Health System. Welcome. Thank you. So as a leader, you have to have other leaders. How do you recognize in a, in a, a health organization leadership quality? Uh, to me, it's pretty straightforward. I think leadership boils down to three things. I think it's uh, integrity, passion, and humility. And I'm surrounded by, I, I think actually in my organization, none of us are leaders. I think we're all healers. And I look for healers that have incredible passion about what they're doing, have great integrity and put patient care above everything else, and also are humble. It's a very, very humbling profession. Uh, we take care of people's lives. We uh, alleviate suffering um, and sometimes cure people. And you've got to keep in mind that when you're in that business, you have to be very humble because the human body and disease can, can, can make you humble. But you're talking to the issue of the ultimate product. What about when you're dealing with the, the administration of the organization? There's leadership in that of other individuals who aren't ill, and they aren't the patients, but they are actually the people that are going to affect the operation of the business. How do you look for that kind of uh, in ingredient. What are the ingredients that you think are the key ingredients? Well, I would go back to what I said before. I don't see those people as not important to the end product or the patient care. So our chief financial officer, our chief information officer, the people that work in billing and collections, to me they're leaders and they're healers. And uh, if they don't do what they do, that nurse at the bedside can't do, do what she needs or he needs to do. So it's to me, I don't make a differentiation between those that actually touch patients and those that allow others to touch patients. So, David, we know we're talking about change and leading change here. And you've uh, led extraordinary change inside the UCLA hospitals. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about what was the imperative there and how you went about it. Sure. So I had this opportunity to take over the UCLA hospitals about three years ago. And I had previously run our psychiatric hospital. I'm trained as a child psychiatrist. And I, I literally walked down the hall from the psychiatric hospital into the medical center and spent probably three to four hours per day on patient beds, literally sitting down. I'm the director of the hospital. Nice to meet you. How's the care? And I'm a slow learner and figured out after about three months, I figured two things out. One, we perform miracles. We, we do things that nobody else does. We've done more organ transplants than any hospital in the United States. We're gearing up to do our first limb transplant probably in January. The other thing that I learned was the hot food wasn't hot, the cold food wasn't cold, no one knew what was going on, the place was dirty. We were short on bedpans and wheelchairs. And at that time, we were ranked as the number three hospital in the United States. And I would say to my team, God forbid you get admitted to the fourth hospital. I mean, how bad could it be? So I thought if we could actually put the patient first, that would really change what we delivered. So not only would it be the most technologically advanced hospital with the best doctors and the best nurses, but we would actually be a caring organization. You know, if you looked at our numbers back then or asked people would they refer us to a friend, three years ago, our emergency room was in the 14th percentile. This is a score you want to be higher, not lower. Overall, we're about 30th percentile. Uh, now we're consistently ranked in the 99th percentile among 6,000 hospitals in the country on two questions. Would you refer us to a friend and would you rate us on a scale of 1 to 10? For academic medical centers, we're ranked as the number one on that. And we've really changed our mission. And I don't know what it was three years ago. It should have been something like, isn't it a privilege you get to see us? Um, to now, it's, and we live it every day, is to heal humankind one patient at a time by alleviating suffering, promoting health, and delivering acts of kindness. Now, I'm sure we're the only academic medical center with kindness in its name, but we live up to that every single day. So attitude is, is critical, not just aptitude, obviously, in the way you deal with it. Was that, was that grown out of your experience as being a, a, a child psychiatrist and, and, and dealing with uh, patients at that level? Yeah, Peter, I think it's a great question. In, in our psychiatric hospital, Again, this was in our old building circa 1950 with not good elevators and residents and no bathrooms and, you know, it looked like a jail. We, we took 40% of our patients involuntarily. 
meaning they were suicidal or homicidal, and we literally brought you in in leather restraints. And 90% would refer us to a friend to discharge. They would hug us when we left, and when they left our care. And we didn't have a lot of tools. We weren't doing a lot of transplants. We have a few meds, and we do a lot of talk in psychiatry. So when, you, when I thought if we could combine that sense of compassion and caring with the incredible technological advances that we have outside of psychiatry in particular, that it would be a real winning combination. And, and, and it turned out to be such. How, talking now in, in how you actually get this done, so how many uh, staff are there at the UCLA hospitals? So we have about um, 7,500 staff. We have about 2,000 doctors, 1,500 residents, 3,000 volunteers. So together, if you look at it all, we're pretty close to, it gets up between, depending if you count, clinical faculty, around 18,000 people. So you have this beautiful and, and touching mission statement. How do you get that down to the 18,000 person well, so that it's shared, that it comes across every patient at a time? Well, the, the mission statement came from the staff. It didn't come from above. Um, the mission statement is lived out every day by the staff. And oftentimes, those staff people are also our patient. So there was a turning point where one of my medical directors, his father had died in our hospital. And we were so um, uncaring that as his dad had passed away, he couldn't find where he was. And this is a guy who's one of our own. And his wife had just got diagnosed with breast cancer, and he said to us, the leadership team, that he wasn't going to bring his wife to UCLA because of the terrible experience he had with his dad. Not a technical experience, but a caring uh, experience. And I felt that if we couldn't even take care of ourselves, we should be out of business. Um, and what we did was really start focusing on how we care for one another as patients, when we're patients. And the, the standard for me and I would say this goes through the whole organization, is everybody should be cared for as if it was somebody in our own family. And so that's how we approach every one of our patients. You know, we get five patients per day by helicopter. We get a million and a half patients that trust their lives to us every year in our outpatient setting. So we have great opportunity to really prove ourselves to each one of those patients, uh, to make them feel as if they're our most important patient. When you look at the metrics, not just the status of somebody else saying we are the number one hospital, when you look at them, do you actually canvas and talk directly to the patients upon release and, 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 and try to find um, how to be better, how to constant and never-ending improvement? How do, you, how do you work on that? That's my singular focus. So I still spend probably three to four hours a day. I was a few minutes late to getting here seeing patients. And so I go up e either in our parking lots or our waiting rooms or in our operating rooms or in our patient care rooms. I knock on the door. Everybody gets my card and my cell phone. Everybody gets the message to call me 24 hours a day. And my questions are, how's the care? Is there anything I can do to help you? Can I help you to the commode? Is there a problem with the food? Are people explaining things to you in a way that you understand? Are we treating your pain? Is there somebody in your family that we need to bring into the loop that we're not? Is there a particular staff member or doctor that you'd like me to comment for because of their great care? I do that day in and day out. Uh, we have probably among those 18,000 people about 250 senior level management. Um, that's now part of their job description. We do that in the middle of the night. We come at 11 or 1 in the morning. We do it on weekends. We do it on holidays. Uh, unfortunately, in our business, um, medical illnesses don't take days off. Uh, so we're here 24 hours a day doing just that. Now when I go into patient rooms, um, it's not unusual that there are five business cards on the nightstands with cell phones written down. And from a patient perspective, they don't really care if it was the CEO or the COO. They just know somebody in a suit came in, listened to them, and, and tried their very best to attend to all their needs. And the staff also appreciate it. I mean, they see that the, the most important thing is the patient care, and that's where we are assisting our incredible staff. David, you um, mentioned that when you came in, UCLA hospitals were number three in the nation. That doesn't give you a sense 
if you're somewhere in there of, of great urgency, hey, we're number three. That ain't bad. So how did you create the sense of urgency? I know you had it, but how did you create it among others? Well, the number three in the nation is based on um, some quality metrics, like if, if you have a heart attack, what are the chances that you die? Well, we do better than other places. It's based on our, our, our um, reputation, and it's also based on the breadth of our services. So it's a great place to come if you're dying. But if you had a choice, you wouldn't come to our facility. And I would say that's true for many academic medical centers. What was missing, and you just had to talk to our patients, well, two out of three patients would not refer us to a friend at discharge, even if we were the third best hospital in the country, because um, we didn't connect with you in a way that was human. We didn't focus on what was going on. We didn't answer your questions. We really came across as if you were lucky to see us. Uh, and we'd save your life, but you certainly weren't going to go tell somebody about us because, you know, the parking was confusing. Nobody answered the phone. Um, we had trained our staff to have no eye contact. I mean, if you went up to a unit secretary, they had been trained to not look at you. Um, we weren't dressed right. We're now the only hospital in the country that has everybody in uniform. Um, we've really worked on scripting from the valet parker that meets you at 5 in the morning, says, welcome to the best hospital. We've been expecting you. And from that point all the way through to your discharge, there's, there's 18,000 people focused on your care. And you measure that not the, with the old measurement of your number three or number two or number four because you found that to be wanting. How do you measure that? How do you actually measure that response? So for the rankings, I keep saying forget about the rankings. Let's take care of patients. The rankings will take care of themselves. I give that same answer about the finances. The, the way we measure it, so there's, there's a uh, uh, all hospitals are post-discharge patients are sent a question the same way when you get your car fixed. So an outside agency ask these particular questions. It's about 20 questions, two of which we focused on. The two that we focused on are probably closer in the business world to the net promoter score, although we don't subtract out our detractors, but it's looking at how many people would refer you to a friend and rate you on a scale of one to 10. So it's the same question, same questionnaire that you would get if you were discharged from our hospital or another hospital. Actually, the Medicare website now actually reports it publicly, so the government is going to start um, rewarding and taking away based on that score. So do you think your external brand changed as your cultural internal, internally changed? And oh, in what way? Absolutely. Um, well, one, we've stopped our marketing because the best marketing has been these patients it become our ambassadors. Uh, I, I, I said to my wife when I took this role on three years ago that I'm going to measure my success as one day I'm going to be in a Starbucks with her and just overhear some conversation behind me that somebody went to UCLA and had this kind of wow experience. And then it came true. There was actually an article in The Atlantic where uh, a writer, well-known, got cancer and came to UCLA. And really, the whole article is you don't want cancer, but if you get cancer, this is the place to go because it was a wow. So that, that we weren't known for that. We weren't known as a place where um, we weren't, last night I got an email. And the email was um, a nurse is concerned because a, a brother of a patient, they're both in their 80s, keeps coming to visit his sister. And she doesn't think that the brother is doing well. And we want to get meals delivered in the room so the brother can eat with his sister. And it happens immediately. Um, we weren't known for that kind of stuff. We were known for taking a liver, chopping it in a lot of pieces. Everyone got one, and everyone went out with a new liver. We still do that. Um, but there's this kind of, there's a lot of kindness that's wrapped around that. Thank you. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. You're welcome.